Welcome to the Ironwood Strength Show, where the information is raw, unscripted, and un... Well, today it's going to be not so unedited. Um, what this actually is, is I took... I recorded three videos previously. They are all posted on YouTube uh, about training the posterior chain. And as I was going through that process and recording those videos and, and thinking about them, I really felt that I wanted to have them all together and a part of the lecture series. And the lecture series is the longer videos that are on YouTube, uh, some of them over an hour long, covering uh, basically one topic at a time. Uh, those are also the episodes that are on Spotify as uh, the podcast. Okay, the, so uh, that's what this is. I'm going to be using. Uh, I'm going to include some transitions to try to make it a little bit smoother. Um, I have cut some of those videos down uh, and. I'm going to utilize, or so it might feel a little bit choppy uh, in those areas because it's I can't transition smoothly from one video to the next, or at least um, I'm not transitioning smoothly from one video to the next. So, um, but this puts all three of the videos uh, in one place, and it will be available on the podcast as far as training uh, or how to train the posterior chain. So, without further ado. Here is part one. Yeah. Today, we're going to go over training the chain. What is that exactly? That's the posterior chain. And if you go back 15, 20 years ago, the hot topic in strength conditioning, strength sports, was the posterior chain and developing and strengthening the posterior chain. So what is the posterior chain? What are we referring to when we mention the posterior chain? Most commonly, when people say this or coaches say this, they're referring to three muscle groups. That's the hamstrings, the glutes, and the low back. Those three groups of muscles are extremely, they're vital to performance. Uh, they're vital to the performance of the squat and the deadlift, they are vital to the performance of the clean, the snatch, even important for the jerk. Uh, strong man, you can't get by without it, uh, without a strong posterior chain. And even in your, your field sports, team sports, uh, whatever you want to call them, soccer, football, the hamstrings, basketball, track and field, I can go on. The hamstrings, glutes, and low back are just a necessity of improving performance, okay? And also, preventing injury, okay? And I'm going to go over a little bit of that as we go. I would also make an argument, a very strong argument, that the posterior chain should be, should include more than that. Okay? It should include everything that you can't see on me right now. Okay, Everything that's behind me. So if I were to turn around, which I won't completely turn around, but if I were to uh, turn around, you would see my traps definitely be included. My lats would be included. Of course, working on down, you have your low back, then your glutes, and then your hamstrings, but also the calves. Okay, all of these muscle groups are very important to improving performance, whether it be in the weight room, on the court, or on the field. Why do I mention these additional muscle groups? And I'm going to throw one more out there in here in just a second, but why do I mention these additional muscle groups? They are your support system, okay, your lats due to where they attach are also instrumental in providing uh, stability for your spine. They provide uh, stability for if you are benching. They are providing your base to bench from. They provide stability and are um, 
and help improve tightness when you're squatting. They're important for bracing the spine and maintaining spinal posture in a deadlift, a clean, a snatch. Okay? There, and it just continues, if you look into different sports, they, the lats help provide shoulder health. They pr protect the spine. So they are very important uh, and improve performance in the case of uh, throwing sports such as baseball or volleyball because the lats have a huge uh, role in bringing that arm down as you're throwing. Your traps help protect the neck. Okay, They aren't just there for looks. Uh, they provide strength in the upper back, but they also protect the neck in sports such as football or, um, or soccer. Your calves, they in, are involved not just in that final push when you're trying to jump, but also in protecting the knee and, and injury prevention for the knee. So these muscle groups all play a very important role. Your hamstrings and glutes and uh, your hamstrings, glutes, and low back are, of course, your motor house. Okay, that is what that is your engine. Vitally important for sprinting, jumping, any form of deadlift. They are they are going to be the primary group bringing that bar off the ground and, and extending your hips as you come up. Same with the squat, the clean, the snatch. Uh, extremely important in a clean and a snatch. But as far as that hip extension, you, all three muscle groups are firing and you have to finish very hard and strong with the glutes. If you don't have these muscle groups well developed, all of these lifts will be down. Your squat will be down, your deadlift will be down. Your cleans and your snatches will definitely be down. I'm not trying to minimize the importance of the quads, but I have to overemphasize the development of that posterior chain. It is just too vitally important to uh, so many different sports, uh, especially, and it's easy to see in the weight room, but even in, in a sport like soccer, your acceleration, your... Um, or you're sprinting, or if you're in basketball, if you're trying to go up for a rebound, that is your posterior chain getting the most, or doing most of the work going into that jump or into those sprints. Your lats, which I've already covered, your lats, your traps, stability, okay? Very important for stability. Uh, a football player, when he's blocking, alignment. If he's blocking, he still has to have support in the backside. Yes, you're thinking block here is all shoulders and triceps, but that support in the backside coming from the lats uh, and the glutes is going to keep him, really keep him from getting toppled over. Train the chain. I'm going to throw one more muscle group into this. Again, like I said, when you're turned around, what's back behind you? If I'm in my anatomical position, the triceps are also behind me. If you want to have a strong bench, a strong overhead press, a strong uh, jerk, you have to have very, very strong triceps. And where are the triceps located? They are in the back of the body. Uh, do they fall into that normal chain if you're just working your way down the body? No, but they are on the back side. They're on the posterior side. Everything in the back has to be trained. Okay, you have to train everything in the back and develop it. If you just look at it, someone walking down, there's two people walking down the street. One's bodybuilder, got huge shoulders, huge pecs. You know, you can see his biceps, but then he turns around and it's very obvious he doesn't have anything in the backside. And I'm not saying... the a competitive bodybuilder because they do develop their their backsides very well. The next guy is more of a powerlifting style guy. Okay, he's training everything in the back. Watch those two. He's gonna have the stuff in the front. He can't avoid it. 
Okay, you can't avoid having um, having shoulders in the front or pecs because of, of all the benching he does, or even some quads. But look at that! Look at that backside and how well developed it is, and how strong he's going to look if all that the traps, the lats, the hamstrings, the glutes, if those are all well developed, he is going to have a much stronger looking physique. Now, I'm not here just thinking about looks. I am thinking about primarily about performance. Uh, and I, do, I think with the things that I've just mentioned, you can't go wrong training everything in the backside. I would overemphasize it to a great degree. Okay, You will get the stuff in the front through normal training. You are going to hit your quads. You are going to hit uh, the muscle, your chest when you're benching. You're going to hit the front of your shoulders uh, when you're benching and you're doing overhead pressing. But it's the muscles in the back that are going to make everything work. Okay, it's the, it's the posterior delts that are protecting your shoulder. It's the traps that are protecting your shoulders and necks. Your lats are protecting your shoulders and your spine. Your hamstrings are the wheel, the, the absolute engine the, sprinting down the track. Your glutes cannot be underdeveloped or, or overdeveloped. You have to have very strong and powerful glutes to have proper hip extension when you're jumping, proper hip extension and sprinting, hip proper hip extension in a clean or a snatch or a jerk. Okay? Um, your low back. It is involved in all of that. It is involved in hip extension to a uh, to a, a certain degree because you can't extend your hips without also extending your spine. You don't want to do all your work with your low back, but it is certainly vitally important. But even more so than just performance for the low back, but also spinal stability. Okay. Yes, your abs and your obliques are definitely very important to to having good spinal stability, but also the muscles in your low back. They assist very heavily in the deadlift, very heavily in the squat, the clean, the, the uh, snatch, okay? Um, for performance and for injury prevention. The low back helps maintain proper posture while you're lifting. You can't go wrong by training the low back. Just make sure you're training it properly. Your triceps, vitally important, as I've already discussed, for the bench, for the uh, for the overhead press, for the jerk. If your triceps are weak, you can't lock out properly, whether that being quickly or driving from all the way from bottom or from their chest to lock out in the bench press. In a jerk, they have to be locked out very fast, very aggressively, and very uh, very powerfully, or you're going to receive the weight here and you're going to have to try to press it out. You have to lock it out and lock in one motion. Your triceps are what's doing that. So, as I've stated, train the chain. Not just your low back, your glutes, and your hamstrings, but everything on the back side. From your traps all the way down to your calves. Alright, that concludes part one. Uh, hopefully, that was clear as to what the posterior chain was or is and um, and why it's important uh, to train the posterior chain and put so much emphasis on the posterior chain. Uh, part two coming up now or next will cover how to train or how I train uh, the standard definition of the posterior chain which would be the low back uh, the glutes and the hamstrings, looking specifically at those three uh, muscle groups. And this is, like I said, it's what I do. Uh, there are many options here as far as how to train. I just want to give you guys some ideas of, of how to put this into a program. I'm going to kind of go through what I do. Certainly, this is not uh, an exhaustive list. You may want... To, you may need to do things differently. You may find other lifters or coaches that train uh, the posterior chain a little bit differently, more frequently, less frequently, uh, whatever the case may be. I'm just going to give you some ideas. Uh, hopefully, especially if you're new to lifting, just try to get you kind of pointed in the in the right direction or, or new to setting up your own program or whatever the case may be. I will also hit some on 
uh, some things on working with athletes, maybe beginning athletes, uh, just kind of, well, we'll kind of see wh where everything goes with this. So, got to just kind of work, um, I don't know if top to bottom is the right, the right word, but maybe talk from the biggest things and then I'll work my way down. So, my go-to, uh, which I have stated before in the, pa uh, in the past, that my go-to for training the posterior chain, the entire posterior chain is going to be the RDL. Um, and some people prefer a stiff leg deadlift over an RDL. That's fine. Not a big deal. But uh, those would be my go-tos uh, as far as getting the most bang for my buck uh, out of an exercise. So I'm going to put in RDLs uh, in place of, not in place of, but behind my squat. So as a powerlifter, I'm going to squat first. Uh, that's going to be, for me, it's usually on Mondays. And then my RDLs are going to follow that, okay? They are a supplemental special exercise for the squat. Uh, and... I get a lot out of them for my squat. So I'm going to do it right after I squat. The good mornings would also fit in that place. So I'm not always going to do RDLs. I may do RDLs for three to four weeks and then switch it up and do good mornings. And there are different variations of both. Um, I'm just kind of speaking in general terms here because obviously you can do RDLs with a close stance or with a wide stance. Stiff legs, you can do the same thing. Good mornings, there's many variations of good mornings that you can do. Um, you know, you have your regular good morning, you have an extreme arch back good morning, you have good mornings off of pins or or coming out of, the, uh, out of safety chains. Um, so suspended, chain suspended good mornings. Um, good mornings with a wide stance. There's different variations of these exercises. I'm just speaking in general terms. So if... I squat first, then I will do either a RDL or a good morning variation second. Okay, so how would I pick um, my sets and reps for that exercise? For me, it's going to depend on where I'm at in my training. So in earlier blocks of training, that supplemental exercise, I don't focus as much on that. Okay, but in the, in the middle blocks of training, I focus very heavily on that. So that kind of determines my sets. Three to th about three sets would be all I would do in a very early block of training because I'm going to focus a lot more time on my assistance work, my smaller assistance work. When I get into those middle blocks of training, that's when I focus on uh, my supplemental work, the, the, those supplemental exercises that are close in technique that are going to really build up my main squat or my main deadlift. Um, and you may not train using a block style and that's okay. Some of this still applies, some of it doesn't. But as I go, so then I may be doing up to five, six, probably not six, but sometimes I probably do. Uh, five to six sets. I would say four to six sets when I'm really trying to hit uh, those supplemental exercises very hard. When I get into my later blocks of training, I'm putting a lot more time, still probably getting around four sets, but I'm putting a lot more effort into my main exercise at that point. So my, my kind of back off things like RDLs just a little bit. Um, still train them hard, but maybe with not quite as much volume. Uh, so when I am trying to push these exercises, I'm doing four, five, maybe not very often, but maybe up to six sets of RDLs or good mornings, depending upon which one I have in at the time. Uh, what do my reps look like? Sir, you can certainly do higher reps. I tend to veer away from that with the good morning due to the nature of the lift. Um, I think you can get yourself in more trouble or trouble can happen quicker with a good morning since the bar is load, loaded on top of, more on top of your spine. So 
uh, the compressive forces combined with if you start to lose your posture and you start to go into flexion, um, that can cause problems a lot quicker versus if the bar is in your hands, when you lose your posture, you can just drop the bar. Okay, uh, that's coming more from a safety aspect that I do, I don't go really high reps with these. With the RDLs, certainly I can get up to 15 at times. I don't do that very often. With the um, good morning, I pretty much limit it to 10 reps or less. Um, and for, those, for that reason, for the safety aspect, that as the set goes on and you become more fatigued, the chance of you losing your posture um, increases. And with athletes, with lifters are going to be better at, because that's what they do, they're going to be better at focusing and maintaining, uh, being able to maintain posture. When it comes to working with athletes, you can demand focus all you want, but you're only going to get so much focus because that isn't what they do. They're doing it to assist their sport. A lot of athletes don't like to lift. Okay, so they'll go in, they'll work hard for you, but understand that their focus is not the same as someone that is a lifter. So uh, doing high reps and their, their body control in the weight room is not as good as a lifter, uh, generally speaking. So they're, um, the chance of them losing technique as the set goes on and on goes up. Okay, so for them, definitely I don't do... Uh, or I didn't really ever do more than sets of 10 and good mornings and RDLs were similar and that I wanted to keep the reps below 10 uh, or 10 or below. Now, the other reason you would want your reps to be lower is because this is a bigger bang for your buck exercise and you can get a lot more strength out of it. So, um, you're not going to gain as much strength doing sets of 10 as you are doing sets of six or fives. Uh, so therefore, because I really feel, and I think a lot of lifters are on the same page and coaches, that the, uh, you're, you can get a lot more from a strength perspective out of your RDLs and good mornings, and it would be better it, you would be better served keeping those reps lighter, but heavy sets at those reps to get the most strength you can out of it. Um, and I will get down myself, I will get down to very heavy sets of five uh, in both the good mornings and the RDLs or stiff leg. Um, I really don't go below sets of five very often. Uh, because of the precariousness of the lift, I feel that the that the um, it's too. Once you start to lose technique, you're not getting as much out of it, and injury risk goes up. So with RDLs, uh, it's really easy to start breaking down technically, uh, whether it's postural, uh, spinal posture, or whether it's that upper back, uh, your your traps. And, and lats losing losing posture more in your mid to upper back. So either one is taking away from the lift. Um, and the same thing with good mornings. So with the good mornings, it's going to be more happen in the low back versus the upper back. Uh, but still, that's something we want to uh, get away from because as that happens, the injury risk goes up. Now, uh, with good mornings... You can, I don't think it's necessary, I think you can easily get to maybe some heavy triples. I wouldn't go all out three rep max triples, but definitely getting some heavier triples a little bit easier with the good mornings than with the uh, RDLs. That's my personal opinion on that, okay? But that's how basically I'm going to train the, that second exercise, the RDLs, stiff legs, good mornings, it's going to be, depending upon where I'm at, anywhere from three up to five or six sets, uh, typically keeping the reps. And I, I do push these heavy as heavy sets, but keeping the reps generally from five to ten. Okay, so let's move on. Let's focus on uh, the hamstrings now. 
the hamstrings, my go-to is the glute ham raise, right? I was once told that for the glute ham raise, you never want to do more than six reps per set because the hamstrings are primarily a fast twitch muscle group. Uh, I followed that for a long time. The one thing with that is that I do, as reps go up in the hamstrings, you, you can do more than six reps, it's fine. You can do more than six, especially if you're a bodybuilder who's wanting to put mass on your hamstrings. Uh, but, but even for athletes or for power lifters or strong men or weightlifters, uh, they can, you can do more than six reps, especially if you're lacking uh, in the hamstrings, glutes area. Um, it would be a good idea to put some muscle mass on there so you have more to work with. Uh, but I also, going back to that idea of doing sixes, I also really like the idea of loading up your glute ham raises um, with a dumbbell. You grab a dumbbell, hold it on your chest, and when I do, when I'm talking about doing glute ham raises, I'm only talking about when you lower yourself, you are only lowering to parallel. You're not going down and doing that hyperextension or the back extension phase. Um, I feel that that leads to bad technique in the glute ham raise, so I always stop and I coach the athletes that I worked with um, to always stop right at parallel and then keep your hips locked in and only use your hamstrings to bring yourself up. Okay, so the only movement that you see is coming from knee flexion. This is another exercise that, depending upon where I'm at, would depict where, how many sets I'm doing. Earlier phases of training, because it's a building exercise, it's a developmental special exercise for the squat and the deadlift, I would be doing more sets. Three, four, five uh, sets per workout. Uh, with the, as I go on, and I'm getting closer, and the glute hammer is such an important exercise, such a valuable exercise, um, as far as increasing hamstring strength that will benefit you when it comes to squatting, that I would probably keep my volume up for a lot longer period of time. But as I go on, as I'm getting closer to a competition or a test date, I probably would cut my volume back on that, um, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't cut it out. I definitely would not cut the exercise out. I would, and that's it's an exercise I really don't like to cut out very often. Not that I never cut it out and replace it with something, but it is my absolute go-to, um, and I just kind of change what I'm doing with it. Uh, sets and reps, resistance isometrics, eccentrics, whatever, but it is going to be in the program a lot, okay? It is the primary way uh, that I build the hamstrings when it comes to speaking of a hamstring exercise. So uh, it's going to be in there quite frequently, And but if you can handle more weight, definitely handle more weight, okay? Grab a dumbbell, have someone hand you a dumbbell and hold it on your chest. And, but don't let technique break down. If you start breaking at the hips when you have a weight, you either need less weight or no weight. All right, It has to be done uh, strictly to get the most out of it. Um, moving on to the low back. Okay, How would I train the low? And, and glute ham raise, I typically, just stepping back just a second, I will typically do that on my squat day. But... It can be done twice a week. I typically just do it once, and I feel that that's enough stimulation for me, and I think that goes along with why I can keep it in the program for a longer period of time and continue to make progress with it. Uh, if I did it twice a week, I would probably stall out on progress and need to change it up. So that's, that's how I do that. Okay, so moving on from the hamstrings, let's focus on the low back now. The low back is, it can be trained different ways. And if you saw 
I had a short that I talked about the reverse hypers, the, num the number one exercise for the low back. Uh, that could be debated. It is what I believe, but not everyone handles reverse hypers well. Okay, there are people that struggle and it actually causes them more pain to do reverse hypers. Um, I think those individuals are kind of few and far in between, but it definitely they're, they're definitely out there. So uh, for them, the reverse hypers might not be an option, or they need to spend a lot of time developing the glutes and doing other low back work that uh, will help to prepare their body to handle the the reverse hyper better. Okay, so reverse hypers for me, I'm going to put them in on my deadlift day. And this is another one. You could certainly do it both days. Uh, I typically prefer to have it on my deadlift day, which falls on Friday. I will do it a little bit later in the workout because they're, they're not quite as technical as some of the stuff that I do beforehand. So I move it back a little bit in the workout and generally train it from 10 to 15 reps. But going up to 20 certainly is an option. I really wouldn't get below 8 hardly ever uh, just due to what the, the needs of the low back higher reps tend to be a little bit better but 10 to 15 is typically the range that I'm in most often um, I do rotate reverse hypers in and out that uh, I don't do them all the time they are in frequently uh, but other exercises that you could do definitely back extensions if you want to get more out of your back extensions, and this is just the simple hyper extension as a lot of weightlifters call it, um, or a back raise uh, where you're in a Roman chair and this is my, my legs, this is my body, and you're just coming to here, okay? Now when I do these, I don't advocate the hyper extension where you're coming up above parallel. Don't do that, that is not a good thing for your back. Just come up to parallel and stop. Um, Again, 10 to 15 reps per set, two to three sets per workout. Um, most likely, if you've been training for any amount of time at all, unless you're a very heavy lifter, you're gonna need to add some resistance, okay? Uh, you can do it with bands or dumbbells or plates. Uh, a lot of people will grab a weight and put it on their chest. I'm more of an advocate of putting it behind your head. Uh, that increases the distance from your hips to the to the weight, which makes it more difficult. Okay, and that's what I want out of it. I want it to be more difficult. That way, uh, I'm getting more out of it strength-wise. And you could say, well, I can just grab more weight and put it, hold it on my chest. Um, that is true, but in in my opinion, it still doesn't match holding a weight behind your head, even though it's less weight than what you can hold on your chest. Um, I feel you get more out of uh, holding the weight behind your head. Um, and again, two to three sets of 10 to 15 reps, and you can push the weight on that, uh, try to get it up to where it's fairly heavy. Another great exercise is the back extension in row. I have a video of that. Uh, I believe I use the little and symbol, so back extension, little and symbol thing that you got going on there, uh, and row. So do a search for that. You should be able to find it. Ironwood strength, back extension, and row. It is a very good exercise at training the low back isometrically. Okay, and, and uh, I think that that goes a long way. Done in earlier phases of training, I think that that goes a long way for helping further gains in cons adding concentric strength um, as time goes on. Okay, my low back... And then the other thing I'll do a lot for low back is pull-throughs. Now pull-throughs are kind of like RDLs in that they hit everything, uh, but I do it more, a little bit more specifically using, you can use different stances, you can use stiff leg versus bent leg, um, but that's another one for me that, that, I, that I feel that really benefits my low back. Typically, I'll do pull-throughs on Monday after at the end of my squat workout, and I do move it pretty much all the way to the end of the workout. Um, two to three sets, 10 to 15, 20 reps per set. 
Okay, on Monday, that's for my low back, and then on Friday for my low back is when I'm gonna be doing things more like uh, reverse hypers, uh, back extensions, things of uh, that target the low back a little bit more specifically. So the only thing we're really missing right now uh, off the top of my head is the glutes. And I am definitely an outside the box thinker when it comes to how to train the glutes. I've tried a lot of the things that are out there and I find that most of it are kind of gimmicky. I've tried the barbell hip thrusts and I know all the praise that barbell hip thrusts get. I didn't feel like I got as much out of them. I felt the discomfort level wasn't worth the what I was getting out of them, which was minimal. Okay, so I was putting myself in a lot of discomfort and barely getting anything out of it. Um, if you go back about 10 to 12 years, okay, so this is 2024. If you're going back to 2012 or 2012 to 2014, I seem to remember the barbell hip thrust becoming all the rage in the powerlifting community. And these big time lifters were doing barbell hip thrusts with like 500 pounds, 600 pounds. Now no one talks about it. But now the fitness community has picked up on it and now that's their big thing is doing barbell hip thrusts. Um, I think the reason it's no longer in the powerlifting community, or at least it's not talked about anymore, is that it's not nearly as effective as what people thought it was going to be. Um, it's picked up in the fitness community as, in my mind, a more of a gimmicky thing. This is the new fad. This is what's popular now. And so we have to do it. I choose not to. I don't think it's, I don't think it's worth it. So getting into what I wanted to get into was how do I train the glutes? Um, understand that the glutes are hit in almost all posterior chain work. They're hitting RDLs. They're hitting good mornings. They're hitting reverse hypers, uh, even in back extensions. Uh, pretty much everything you do for your posterior chain is hitting your glutes. So I don't see a huge necessity to have a ton of glute work in the program. That doesn't mean I avoid it. It's just not a big uh, point of emphasis to me when everything I do already hits the glutes. Okay. Now, I'm going to go on that just a little bit more. When you're doing reverse hypers, you should be thinking about squeezing your glutes as you kick that weight up, okay? Uh, excuse me. Don't just try to make it all low back. You should be using your glutes along with that. The same thing with back extensions. When you're doing good mornings and RDLs, you want to focus, if you have your hips here, okay, and you go down, you lower the weight, you want to focus on rotating your hips, okay, to come back up. Don't just try to strain and use your low back to lift the weight. That's not how those exercises should be done. You should be rotating your hips and snapping your hips through um, as you come up, okay? That will get more of your hamstrings involved and more of your glutes involved. And that's how, uh, and it will help improve uh, hip function. If you don't intentionally try to use your glutes and use your hips, you will lose function in those areas. So we want to try to actually uh, focus on utilizing the glutes and rotating those hips to bring yourself back up, okay? So that's that. Now let's get into what I would actually do specifically for the glutes. I have one exercise, okay? And that is, and yes, there are other things out there um, but there's one exercise that, that tends that I want to bring up here. That's a dumbbell walking lunge. To me, it is one of the best glute exercises you can do, and it is very functional and that you're going through a movement pattern uh, while you are utilizing your hips. So when you step and you drop, if you drop your back leg and you're Weight should be on your front heel. And then you're going to pull yourself forward up 
Okay, so as you you step down, come down as you as you bring that leg forward. Now you're at your lower lowest position. Okay, then as you pull yourself forward with that lead leg, your glutes are actually going to be squeezing as they as they elevate your body and, and straighten out your your leg is extending and your hip is extending at the same time. It would be better instead of as you step, instead of doing a lunge, step, 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 step. Okay, it would be better to step all the way through. So as I step, my next step is going to go all the way through to the next step. They're not going to, I'm not going to bring my feet together and stop on every rep. That will force my glute to work harder all the way through to the next step. Okay, um, but I just think the, the, the dumbbell walking lunges done properly, done with good technique, are outstanding for your glutes and for glute development and uh, and building the glutes in a functional manner uh, that will carry through that you can utilize as you go into your squatting as you go into your deadlifts as you go into if you're a sprinter for sprinting okay is it, is it a direct carryover for sprinting probably not extremely direct but um, I think it's going to be a lot better than doing some of these other exercises like all your glute bridges and 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 certainly there's a place for some of the bridges I do like them for activation exercises but as a training tool um, I don't think you're getting a ton out of them that is going to carry over to actual performance uh, and that goes not just for sprinting but for lifting as well um, I think walking lunges there's a lot more to be gained there um, okay now that we've looked at how to train the uh, the glutes, the hamstrings, the low back. We're going to move into training the rest, or how to train the rest of the posterior chain. So, looking at the traps, looking at the, we're going to look at the lats. And the one thing I don't cover here is how to train the calves. So, I want to hit that a little bit right here. The calves are. They are important. They're important for injury prevention of the knee. They're important for, um, you know, that last push of a, of a uh, jump. They're also important in your sports when you're trying to ex completely extend as far as, you know, a clean or a weightlifting in your strength sports or a clean or a snatch or even a jerk, any sort of jerk, uh, you are going to get some push with your calves. However, training the calves specifically, such as doing calf raises, donkey calf raises, seated calf raises, I really just don't feel that there's a necessity to do that um, most of the time for sports. It would be better to include exercises such as clean snatches, uh, weighted jumps to hit those calves. And for you know, you're not going to get a lot of carryover or any carryover really from doing a calf raise to your clean. So it's really not beneficial for strength sports as well, other than uh, bodybuilding. So um, I've chosen not to really spend a lot of time talking on those about the, that. The one thing at the start of this ep or start of this part of part three of the episode is I do go back and talk about the glutes a little bit more. Uh, probably repeated myself a little bit, but wanted to hit on some things that I missed uh, in part two. So, um, so that's how this part three will start off. Looking back to the glutes, okay, and I mentioned uh, that I believe I mentioned I felt a lot of the stuff that's out there for the glutes tends to be a little bit too gimmicky uh, to get really solid results, okay. Um, just too small of exercises that really don't have a lot of bang for their buck. Um, and while they do target the glutes, I just don't think you really get a lot out of them in terms, in terms of uh, strength development, uh, which is what we're really going for when we're trying to improve performance or improve maximum strength, whether it be in sports or in maximum strength as far as um, Powerlifting, weightlifting, strongman, things of that nature. So, 
the what I did say that I really did like for um, and first understand a lot of the big posterior chain exercises already hit the glutes fairly significantly if you do them in a manner which will recruit the glutes and I did go into some of that you know with the RDLs and with the good mornings actually focusing on turning your hips and activating your glutes to, to initiate that movement and even finish the movement. Pull throughs hit a hit the glutes very hard uh, if you learn to do the exercise with your glutes versus trying to do everything with your with your low back. And a lot of this boils down to in some of these exercises is knowing how to fire the glutes so that they are working along with the other muscles that you're working. Um, versus just doing the exercise with the low back, which is what a lot of people will do. Um, a reverse hypers is another great example of that, that if you know how to activate your glutes to initiate that kick and even squeeze at the top with your glutes, your glutes are gonna get a lot out of that uh, versus trying to do everything with your low back. So, Basically, my point is a lot of those exercises already recruit the glutes, the RDLs, the hamstrings, glute ham raises to lock the glutes and hips in place, uh, reverse hypers, even back extensions or back raises. Um, all of those utilize the glutes fairly significantly, and I wouldn't change how I train them other than focusing on utilizing the glutes. Same sets and reps, same frequency per week. So then what I went into... As I talked about how walking lunges are my go-to if I'm really thinking glutes and I want something in the program to target the glutes, that is going to be uh, dumbbell walking lunges. I do prefer dumbbells over the barbell. I think it gives an added level of difficulty uh, that you will get a lot more out of. As far as the glutes specifically, I couldn't tell you whether the, you're going to be able to handle more weight with a barbell. Um, but I don't. I couldn't tell you which one is better at necessarily strengthening the glutes. I prefer the dumbbells, um, and I typically would do that for higher reps. About eight reps is as low as reps as I would ever go. Fifteen is pretty much the highest I would ever go. So that range, eight to fifteen reps per set. Generally speaking, about three sets uh, in a workout. If I'm doing sets of 15, I may only do two because I'll pretty, probably be shot if I'm really pushing it on those two sets. Um, I'll pretty much be done and not want to do, not have the desire to do the third set. So that's really where I'm going to fall is about two, maybe two, most likely three sets, uh, eight to 15 reps per set. And that is counting per leg, not total. So it, it for doing sets of 15, it's 15 for the right leg, 15 for the left leg. I don't stop in the middle and put my foot down. I step all the way through, step to step. Okay. Um, beyond dumbbell walking lunges, really the only other thing that I would put in there that I feel has any benefit would be just regular stationary lunges where you step out and then you drive back. Um, I do feel those work. I don't think they're nearly as good as the walking lunges. Uh, but And the sets and reps would pretty much be the same. And I would put these in on, this really doesn't matter. My preference was always to put them in on my squat day. So that would have been Monday for me. Um, and I don't think it really makes that big of a difference. Now they do cause a lot of soreness. So if you have a job where you'd have to, where your soreness is really going to affect your job the next day. Uh, you might want to put it towards the end of the week where you know you're going to have a day or two off before you have to go back to work. Um, that's just from personal experience. Sometimes you want to save those things that cause a lot of soreness, which walking lunges do cause a lot of soreness. Um, but putting those later on in the week so even though I'm more fatigued by that point, I don't have to worry about that affecting my job or something that I may have to be doing during the week. All right, so let's move on. And now I want to get into what I really intended this episode to be on, and that's training the rest of the chain. 
and how I would do it. Again, this is not, there are plenty of other ways to do it, but this is how I've done it and how, what I feel is most effective. So we're gonna start out with the lats. We're gonna start at there and work our way up. Uh, the lats, we know have two main functions and that is one pulling from a horizontal position and two pulling from a vertical position. So your, your horizontal positions are gonna be your rows. It can be barbell rows, it could be the now what everyone likes to call as pin lay rows. I learned it, that same thing many years ago and no one even knew what it was or definitely didn't call it pin lay rows. Um, and yes, we are going back about uh, 15 years. So prior to that, no one knew what a pin lay row was or or it, whatever. People put these names on things all the time and I don't know that they really need to be. Um, so yeah, your pin lay rows, your barbell rows, your um, seated rows, dumbbell one arm rows, dumbbell two arm rows. Um, another one that I really like and I started playing around with it and then I discovered that, oh, people on T Nation are talking about this. I had no idea and it really happened right in the same time frame is the seal row uh, where you're laying on a bench and pulling the weight up. Um, and you set the bench up a little bit higher so your your hands or the dumbbells or barbell or whatever you have doesn't touch the ground and you pull from that position so you're laying flat um, perfectly horizontal and then pull up from there another exercise that I have really liked is that I set the bench up um, so my head is lower than my hips I'm still laying face down just like a seal row um, but essentially I'm in a decline. Okay, so my head is actually much, or I generally go with about a six inch difference. It could be a four to six inch difference is, is decent enough. You could set it up more than that, but you don't want it to be super steep where it feels like you're gonna fall off the bench. Um, but then I do my rows from there. Now when I'm doing my rows, and those are just some examples of exercise variation, so for your execution, I do like it to be as strict as possible. Um, I don't like a lot of body English when you're doing your barbell bent over rows and pulling that uh, entire body. Same thing with your dumbbell rows. I like it to be more strict. Um, I feel you're going to get a lot more out. You can't handle as much weight, okay? but you're going to get more out of it from a strength perspective and from a size perspective as far as putting mass on um, the other thing I want to hit on is technique okay so besides just being or along with that part of the technique as far as being strict but along with that is that when I do my row um, I'm actually trying to pull the bar or dumbbell usually I do this with dumbbells more than I worry about it with the barbell but I'm trying to actually pull it back towards my hip. So I'm gonna to try to show this really quick. Um, I don't know how this is gonna go. Okay, so if you see me here, I know you can't see my entire body, but if I'm bent over, instead of just pulling the dumbbell straight up, okay, I'm trying to pull that dumbbell back towards my hips. Okay, I'm still getting a good range of motion, but in doing that, I'm gonna involve less of my traps and it's okay for the traps to work along with the lats. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not even saying pulling straight up is a bad idea. I'm just saying I'm really trying to focus more on the lats. So I'm trying to give the direction of pull a little bit more towards my hips as I pull my elbow up. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Try it out. Okay, does it limit how much you can handle? Yes, but you're getting a stronger contraction in the lats in the process. Okay. Um, and I do that primarily with my, my dumbbell one arm rows and my seal rows. Oh, and here's another exercise variation that I forgot to mention. And I do it with that as well, is a dumbbell incline row where I'm gonna be face down on an incline bench um, and doing, but my head is now at the higher end. And I generally do that on one of your 
not a super steep incline, but definitely not a shallow incline, uh, kind of right in the middle. Um, and I'm going to pull basically the same way. I'm rowing the dumbbells back and trying to get those elbows up as high as possible with the direction of pull being more back or more towards my hips than straight up. Um, so that covers the technique. I'm not going to try to break down every single exercise and how to do it. Uh, I just want to throw a couple technique pointers out there and that was one is be strict, two give the direction of pull a little bit more to your hip versus straight up. Okay, so how do I train these? So when I was competing, I only trained my lats twice a week. Okay, and I always wanted, I'd, I'd even do it for certain periods of time, I always wanted to train both types of lat movements twice a week. So twice a week for horizontal pulling, twice a week for vertical pulling. But when I was competing, my whole thought process revolved around the squat and the deadlift on those two days. And yes, the lats are extremely important for your squat and deadlift. But I felt there were other things that I needed to focus on on my squat and deadlift days that took precedence over additional lat work. So consequently, when I was competing, I would only train my lats on my upper body days. That was, and I would do my horizontal pulling on my Wednesday, which is my primary bench day. My Sunday, which was my uh, kind of bench assistance day, but I would, if maybe a dynamic effort day, it could have been a overhead and incline day, uh, but that day I would do my vertical pulling. And pretty much for vertical pulling, uh, which I did not go over any exercise variations, but I'll throw that out here in just a second. Um, that was almost always going to be uh, pull-ups of some nature, whether that was pro, uh, neutral grip, an overhand grip, a wide grip. Um, I very rarely did chin-ups. I just prefer the overhand grip. I think I get more out of it uh, than going underhand. But that's my own personal preference. So that was how I would put that in. Let's step back just a moment. Let's get some variations in there for the lats. And I've used all of these. So lat pulls. Everyone knows what lat pulls are. Um, and I would do all different grips. I would get that little V-bar. I would go with a regular wide lat pull grip. Um, I'd do close grip. I would do underhand grip. I'd do all of them. I didn't do a ton of lat pulls when I was competing, even though I think it's a great exercise. It's a very simple exercise, um, but I do think it has a lot of advantages. Mostly, I would do that in early phases of training. As I got to later phases of training, um, and most of the time, actually, I would spend doing pull-ups. And I like to do weighted pull-ups, so I would get down to doing even doubles and triples for my, uh, for my pull-ups in training as heavy days. Okay, so what did I do sets and reps wise? It was basically bodybuilding or your typical assistance work. Uh, for my rows, pretty much always between five to, five to 10 most of the time. In earlier phases of training, I was doing sets of 12 to 15 uh, or 10 to 15. But as it got heavier, I would get into those set heavy sets of five. Um, probably never more than about four sets. And this is back when I was competing. It's, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing now here in just a minute. Um, but probably usually three to four sets. Um, I did put a lot of stock into building my lats. So I was going to push that a little bit beyond... Uh, just normal assistance work. I wasn't going to do just two or three sets. I was going to push it probably, definitely three, uh, maybe four. And I might even throw a down set in there at the end of that for a fourth or fifth set. For my vertical lats, if I was doing lat pulls um, or something with the cable, pretty much everything was going to be 10 reps or higher. Okay. When I went to pull-ups, 
everything was pretty much eight reps or lower. And I would get all the way down, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, all the way down to doubles. Occasionally, I would toss in a rep set in there on pull-ups, uh, which I would get anywhere from 12 to 15. I think my best was around 17 reps, and that was done at the body weight of about 230 pounds. So uh, not over the top fantastic, but still pretty decent. When I got down into those doubles, I, I mean, I started putting weight on as soon as I could, and I would get all the way down into doubles as far as training. And occasionally I would test out my pull-ups and just see how much weight I could handle for a single rep. So that's when I was competing, two days per week. Horizontal on Wednesday, my main bench day, vertical on my bench assistance day, which was on Sunday. Looking to where I am now, I wish I would have changed and trained lats four days a week. I just think that, that looking back at it and seeing the results I'm getting now, even though I'm older, um, in mid-40s at the time, and I'm getting better results with my lats now than I did when I was younger. Um, and I think training the lats four days per week is extremely beneficial. Two days vertical, two days horizontal. And I, I, on my Monday and Wednesday workouts, so Monday is my squat day, Wednesday is my bench day. Those are my high volume days for my lats. Okay, so high volume on Monday is going to be high volume vertical pulling. So I'm going to focus more on uh, almost always lat pulls. I may toss some isometric or eccentric stuff in there, but I'm going to be doing up to five sets of 10 on a high volume day. It generally ranges three sets of 15. I waive it three sets of 15 on week one, three, four sets of 12 on week two, and five sets of 10 on week three. And then I'll back up, I'll change the variation, and I'll go through it again. So that would be my Monday. My heavy day would be Friday for my vertical pulling. That would be my deadlift day. On that day is always going to be some sort of pull-up. Uh, I'll do overhand grip, uh, different widths. I don't have access to the neutral grips anymore. So, uh, But different widths on the overhand grip pull-up. Sometimes I'll toss in a chin-up. I still just prefer the overhand grip. I think I get more out of it um, as far as my lats go. And... I range anywhere from, I very rarely go over five reps. My vertical pulling is gonna be pretty heavy. So it's gonna range, and I'll do, sometimes I get down to three, but it's usually gonna be around four, maybe five sets, and everything is gonna be five reps or less. So I'll get down to heavy singles, generally heavy doubles, all the way to heavy sets of five. Um, and I try to train, I might have a set or two kind of light, and then everything else is gonna be pretty heavy. Rows, I take a higher volume approach. My volume day on Wednesday is going to be the same as my volume day for vertical pulling. Three sets of 15, four sets of 12, five sets of 10. Um, for Sunday would be my, my heavy day for my um, rows. I pretty much only have three exercises that I will do on my heavy day. Dumbbell, one arm rows barbell bent over rows and um, the pin lay row, which I still just call a barbell bent over row with a pause on the floor. But those, that's pretty much all I'm going to do. The heaviest or the lightest I will go will basically be an eight rep max. Okay, So heavy sets of eight. Uh, and I'll probably be doing, again, about four sets per workout. <coughs> but the heaviest I go Unlike the vertical pulling, the heaviest I will go will be heavy sets of five. I really feel that your technique just gets completely thrown out the window the heavier you go. So sets of five, I can still manage my technique fairly well, or actually very well. Once I go below that, I'm going to start to add some body English to it, and I want to stay away from that. Uh, before we move on to the traps, I'm going to throw one more exercise variation out there, and that is the croc row. Um, 
I used to do these and I actually really like them. I would just post my hand up on a, we had dumbbells that was just about the, our dumbbell racks were just about the right height. I would post my hand up on a very heavy dumbbell and pull with the other one and I would rotate my body as I pulled. I really like those and I liked doing them for very high reps. So I would warm up with sets of 10, maybe two, three, four warm up sets. Then I'd grab a very heavy weight and I would just knock out reps. Um, pretty much going to failure or very close to failure. And that would usually put me, 12 would probably be the fewest reps I would get. Up to about 25 would be the highest I would get. And it would just depend on what weight I selected for that day. Um, I, I like that. But at the same time, I think you need to be more developed before you start doing something like that. If you are a beginner to middle range novice or middle range intermediate, uh, you probably don't need to be doing that. Save that for when you're more advanced. So if you're someone that's been training for probably 15 years, 12 to 15 years or more, I think crock rows are fine. But for your younger people that have been lifting for only anything less than 10 years, definitely stay away from that. Stay with something that's definitely and follow a more strict technique. All right, so moving on to the traps. Again, I'll do what I did when I was competing and what I'm doing now. Uh, the traps, to me, need to be trained with higher reps. Doing shrugs for sets of five, I think is a waste of time. But that's my personal opinion. Um, the problem with shrugs is they take so little amount of time that I don't think you get the, the time under tension that you need. Think about it, a shrug is just there and there. All right, if you're listening to this on Spotify, I just shrugged my shoulders. I went through the entire range of motion the time it took me to say there twice. Um, both concentric and eccentric. I think you need more time to develop your traps and you need to do that by doing more reps. So to me, anything less than 10 reps is a waste of time. That's my personal opinion. I would add more reps, 10, 15, 20 reps per set, um, and never really any less than that. Traps are another thing that I would, one of the few things, I don't use straps a lot, okay? I had certain exercises that I would definitely throw uh, grab straps for, but shrugs I almost always grab straps for. And again, I, I like to err on the more strict side versus using a lot of hips and legs to get that bar moving. Um, now certainly, if you're a weightlifter, you may want to utilize some hip drive or some leg drive because that is going to mimic your clean technique or your snatch technique a little bit more. Um, but if you're looking at powerlifting, or, uh, or strong man, I think strict is better. And yes, I do absolutely think there's a good place for shrugs for a power lifter or strong man, um, or even a weight lifter. So, um, what day did I put it on? Typically would be in there on my deadlift day. So, uh, and I would do it later in the workout <clears throat> which was kind of a pain looking back at it because I would have already deadlifted. I already did all my deadlift workout um, and then I'd come back over and load the bar back up after having it completely stripped down uh, to do shrugs. So, uh, but I do think it made a difference in my deadlift and how much weight I could handle without losing that posture in my upper back as far as my deadlift went. Other things that I would do for my, my, that I would consider trap work, even though they are focusing on other things, but that would be things like my rear delts, uh, specifically if I had my palms facing inward. So when I pulled my hands out to the side, my rear delts or my reverse flies, um, I would get more trap activation with that. 
that's not a big exercise. It's going to put a lot of mass on your traps, but it will help develop your traps. Okay, don't forget about those sorts of things, your rear delt work, because your rear delts and your traps work together pulling those shoulder blades, um, pulling your shoulder blades together, pulling your arms out. I'm saying this all wrong right now. Um, basically, yeah, they work together to do that movement. The, it will carry over to your trap size. Shrugs are better for putting on the most amount of traps, but they only work, that only works your traps from an elevation standpoint. Doing your posterior delts or your uh, band pull-aparts will work your traps from a uh, more of a retraction standpoint where you're just pulling your shoulder blades back together, okay? Your traps don't just function from an elevation from elevating your shoulders. They also retract, they also depress. So um, your band pull-aparts, your, um, I just said it a dozen times, your posterior, your rear delt work, your rear wrist flies, that will work it very well from that um, retraction. For depression, I would go with straight arm dips, and that's get up in a dip rack, have your arms locked, let yourself sink as much as you can without bending your arms. Just let yourself sink, and then push with that lower those lower traps, keeping your arms straight, and get up as high as you possibly can. Okay, that's gonna work your lower traps. I did that regularly uh, for very high reps, uh, but I would only do it uh, probably once or twice a week. I usually did it on my bench days as part of my shoulder warm up before I bench. The rear delts I would also do on my bench days, um, usually later on in the workout. Looking at it now, I still do the same thing, but I do it with a much higher volume. So I do get up to doing around five sets per workout of rear delts, uh, usually once a week. Um, another exercise to throw in there would be your face pulls. These I would toss in again on your bench days, probably later in the workout and with very high reps. I don't care if you're doing them with face pulls with a cable um, or with a band, either one. But I always have my do my face pulls, and you don't. It doesn't have to be like this. I always do my face pulls where the the band or cable is attached up high, and I am pulling it down to the top of my forehead. You can do them where the band is straight across or where the band is down low. I like it from up above because I'm gonna get some depression as well as some uh, reach. It's both depression and retraction, which is gonna go a lot further for, for injury prevention than your elevation will. If you're doing it where the band is attached down low or the cable is attached down low and you're pulling it up, still a decent exercise, but it's gonna be almost entirely uh, elevation and so um, elevation is good for developing your traps it will help out with your deadlift but we tend to err not tend to err but tend to too much be too tight up top okay and we need to learn to let those shoulders relax so I don't want to overdo it. And that's something I've probably migrated to more. And that's why I don't do as many shrugs as I used to. And actually, I actually haven't done shrugs in a while. But, um, uh, but if I was competing again, I would have heavy shrugs in there. Regardless of what all the uh, functional movement specialists say about too much trap elevation. Uh, because I do think it carries over very well. Okay, so that's enough on traps. Hit the lats, we hit the traps, so let's focus on the triceps. I have always struggled. I do not have big arms, okay? I never had big arms. I trained my triceps very hard, um, <coughs> but I struggled to gain tricep size. I 
They're not horribly small, um, but compared to your big benchers, I did not have triceps. So for the triceps, there's a number of movements you can do. There's a lot of stuff that I would just toss out right away. Um, so I'll give you my top exercises. My number one tricep exercise is going to be dips. Okay, that's going to be my number one. It's not necessarily the best builder for your bench as you get more advanced. When you're younger, it is. When you're in your first few years of training, up to, up to maybe 10, but definitely the first five years of training, your dips will help your bench out quite a bit. As you get more advanced, um, a lot of people, including myself, start believing that they don't help as much. But we also know there are some of your old time lifters, I hate to say old time, but uh, some of the lifters from the past tended to really rely on dips for developing their triceps for their bench. I don't have the perfect answer on that. I just know that I do think the dips are a great exercise. I don't necessarily see the carryover directly to my bench. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but other great or really good tricep exercises. Skull crushers. Everyone knows it. It's a great exercise. Just try to be strict. Don't let those elbows go out to the side too much. Where you touch on your head, I don't think is a major importance. Um, I generally touch a little bit higher. I think bodybuilders will tend to touch a little bit higher. A lot of powerlifters will actually touch lower. So they'll hold the bar a little bit lower. Um, instead of holding it up more towards their shoulders, they hold it more over their uh, kind of their, their lower pecs, upper abs, and then keep their elbows there. Then it ends up touching around their chin or their mouth. Not a big deal. I do also like... Um, dumbbell skull crushers. I call them lying tricep extensions, but same thing. I think that's another great exercise. Doing them with the dumbbell will take some of the stress off your elbow. So if the barbell or a curl bar hurts your elbows, then stop doing it with the barbell or the curl bar and do them with the dumbbells. If that hurts your elbows, then we need to try to probably take a step back and evaluate what we need to do to fix that. Um, but the dumbbells, having that neutral grip instead of the, the uh, pronated grip, tends to take some of the stress off that elbow and still does a good job of developing the triceps. A variation of that, okay, that was probably popularized out of West Side Barbell was the dumbbell rolling tricep extensions. I've seen it many times done on the floor, uh, which I have never done. I like to just do it on the bench, but it's the same. It starts out like a skull crusher, but I'm going to let my elbows drift down a little bit, roll the dumbbells back, and then I pull my elbows and extend at the same time. Some people describe that as throwing the hands. If you do it right, you'll feel a lot more stress in your triceps. Okay, that supposedly, and I haven't done a ton of these, I have done them, I've been doing them more lately, but what a lot of the big benchers that came out of Westside Barbell would say is that really carried over to their bench very well. Um, another really good exercise is the flared arm extension. That's how I learned the name back many years ago. Dave Tate was writing about it and he called it flared arm extensions. Several years after that, people started calling it Tate Press. Now people are saying they're called Williams Extensions or, or Williams Press or something like that. But basically all it is is I prefer to do them on an incline. You can do them on a flat bench as well. Hold the dumbbells. You can put them together or you can hold them apart. I find that it works differently and they're both good. Okay, so sometimes I do it one way, sometimes I do it the other way. But you're going to let the dumbbells fold in, okay? You're going to bring them all the way to your chest, and then you're going to extend your elbows from there. So if you're, if you're watching this, listening to this on Spotify, then I apologize that you can't see this, and maybe I'll do a, uh, an exercise video on this at some point. But, uh, but basically your elbows are out to the side, 
okay, you're going to come in with the dumbbells. So the dumbbells are coming to your chest and your elbows are going out. Okay, your elbows are going to go out to the side. And then from there, you're going to extend again. I've never had a problem with my elbows with this exercise, but I have had some pain in my forearms uh, just, just below the elbow. Or, yeah, just below the elbow, but in my forearm, not in the elbow. Um, but this is an exercise I really like to have in there to help develop my bench. I think it's a great exercise. Like I said, you can do it where you keep the dumbbells together and they are touching throughout the entire movement on the chest. Both ends of the dumbbells would be touching. And then as you come up, you rotate so only one end of the dumbbell is touching. Or you can do it where you bring the dumbbells together on your chest and then as you extend up, the dumbbells actually come completely apart. I get feel the contraction of my triceps feels different with both of those and it's good with both of those. So I like to do it both ways. Okay, from a programming perspective on the triceps. Oh, one more exercise that I want to put in there. Push downs. I'm not a big fan of cable push downs. I do them sometimes, but I don't think that they're the it's the best exercise or the most effective exercise. Um, usually when I do cable push downs, I'm doing either high reps or something crazy with high reps. I'll do steps, so I'm adding weight every single set until I can't go anymore. Or I'll do strip sets where I, I don't rest in between these sets, steps uh, or strip sets, either one. Where I'll start maybe um, a weight that I can do for 10. I'll do it for 10, I'll take weight off, I'll do it for 10, I'll take weight off, I'll do it for 10, I may get up to doing 50, 60 reps like that. Same thing with the steps, I'll do the same basic concept, getting up to doing 50, 60 reps uh, basically in one set. Um, but I just don't think that the, the cable push down is that great for either um, strength or size. Could it be effective? Yes, um, but it's it's just not the best. I would rather go with different forms of extensions. But band pushdowns I really do like uh, because they you can do them, they lend themselves to high reps, and I'm talking up to 100 reps per set. Uh, generally don't go below 20, sometimes I do get down around 12, 15 reps, uh, but generally I will push that higher and I'll get up to around 100 reps per set. I like these because of how much blood you can flush into your elbow and into your triceps with them. And combined with the fact that because the band does not have as much tension when you're at the top or when you have your hands up closer to your shoulders or your chest and it adds tension as you go down, it's not putting as much negative stress on your elbow. Okay, so this tends to work very well if you have elbow issues. Um, and it allows you to get a good contraction in your tricep as well as flush a lot of blood in uh, to help with the healing process. Okay, so from a programming perspective, um, I do this what I, like, I prefer to do is basically the same as my lats. I have a heavy day and I have a high volume day. My high volume day, depending upon where I'm at in my training, it may be a day just like my lats where I'm doing uh, three sets of 15, four sets of 12 the next week, five sets of 10 the third week, and then I, I'll switch up the exercises and do something different. Or it could be a day, if I'm in the early phases of training, where I'll do a somewhat heavy movement, maybe something like dips, um, for somewhat high volume. Okay, not be, I know I'm not being real concrete here, but I may do, for dips, I may do like three, three or four sets of eight. Or I may do some isometrics, or I may do some, some negatives, some eccentrics. Maybe even three sets of ten. And then, this is in the same day, 
I will do band push downs later in the workout for uh, very high reps, okay, where I'm pushing three sets of 20, uh, two sets of 50, a set of 100, maybe three reps, three different bands in the same set for a total of 100 reps, where I'm getting like 30 something with, or 15 to 20 with the first band. 20 to 30 with the second band and then finish out the rest of the reps uh, up to 100 with the third band. Uh, but I'm, but in that day, that high volume day, I might be doing two exercises. Again, that's only in my early phases of training. After that, it'll just be one exercise. For my heavy day, um, I'll push it generally sometimes up to sets of six. But understand at this point, I'm talking tricep specific work. I'm not talking about the close grip bench that I already did and the bench presses that I already did or the incline or the overhead pressing that I already did, okay, which I've already got two exercises done prior to th doing my tricep work. So on my heavy day, that will be, I might get up to about four sets. So and never less than three. So three to four sets, probably not gonna push it much beyond that. Maybe five sets, but that's very rare. Um, my reps will range from 10 down to about six, okay? Uh, I won't take it beyond six as far as increasing weight because I've already done heavy work with my pressing. And when I'm talking right now about triceps, I'm only talking about tricep mostly specific work so it's it's your extensions your your dips i'm not talking about the pressing exercises such as your close grip benches your board presses your floor press uh close grip presses off of pins your overhead pressing your incline pressing i'm leaving all that out that would be an entirely separate conversation or discussion um so that that's really sums up my triceps heavy heavy day high volume day um, and really push the volume on the volume day and then the heavy weight uh, sets of six would be about the heaviest I would go but I would start with generally around sets of 10 and then progress to sets of six with the same exercise before changing that exercise. Um, all right and that concludes this episode on training the chain or training the posterior chain. Uh, hopefully you liked what you've seen here. Uh, if you do, please hit that like button. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And also please share it with uh, other lifters, other coaches, fitness enthusiasts that are that would want to learn uh, information that's shared here on this channel. But until next time, remember, always be in the pursuit of strength.